Welcome back to the ninth episode of ESI, a webinar series where we discuss how entrepreneurship, startups, and innovation are contributing to shape the post-pandemic recovery across ASEAN and East Asia. I am Julia Maria Marsan, Area Director for Strategy and Partnership, here together with TJ and Lina, um, the co-host of this webinar series. And we are here today to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and sustainable development. Uh, this is a very important topic uh, for ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, and it's also a topic we have been uh, uh, quite active at area. For instance, this year, we are uh, contributing to the ASEAN chairmanship discussion with the inputs to develop uh, a framework for uh, the circular economy for ASEAN. And uh, if you are interested, keep an eye on our website since we will release uh, more information about that uh, very soon. Um, we have an excellent lineup of speakers today uh, to discuss about this very important and timely issue uh, from different countries, uh, from uh, ASEAN, um, from uh, Korea and beyond. We also have uh, one of our colleagues from area, and we will learn more about uh, the Area Center for Marine Plastic Debris. And TJ will introduce uh, all speakers in detail uh, uh, in, in, in a minute. Um, but before uh, uh, giving the floor to TJ, let me just remind to all of you to please keep your microphone on mute, uh, but feel free to interact with us. We want uh, uh, this conversation to be lively and interactive. We have a chat box, so please use it to interact with us and the speakers and ask questions to the speakers because we will go back to your question during the Q&A segment toward the end of this webinar. Um, now, once again, Thank you all for connecting with us today. Uh, many thanks also to the speakers and over to TJ now. Thank you very much, Julia. And a very good afternoon to all our participants. You know, I just want to echo what Julia said. Thank you to our speakers, you know, for taking time out this afternoon to join us. So I want to jump straight in to introduce them to you. You know, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Chan Manwei. He's the founder and principal consultant of Sustainable SG based in Singapore, a fellow entrepreneur whom I've uh, known for about two years now. So, you know, he's a consultant, trainer, and speaker in the areas of sustainability, organizational strategy, risk management, and corporate social responsibility. Um, he advises companies and associations on sustainability strategies implementation. He's an advocate for a greener world, and he has spoken on climate change recycling and other environmental issues at various events. You know, he started out his career more than 20 years ago. Um, he has worked in Singapore in the private and public sectors and has experience in across really a, a varied field of functional domains, uh, policy development, data analytics, operations, sales, you name it, looking at his bio, he has probably done it. You know, his last position was as Divisional Director of Corporate Planning at Sentosa Development Corporation. It's a government agency that oversees, you know, and manages Sentosa as an international leisure and tourism destination. So in his time there, his responsibilities included implementing the Sentosa Sustainability Plan, along with, uh, you know, the environmental social governance dimensions to make sure that this island, this resort island of us, of ours, you know, um, continues to, to have that long-term viability, long-term sustainability strategies. So thank you, Manwe, for joining us this afternoon. Now, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Lee jong -ho. He is Senior Advisor, Deep Science and Technology for the Program Management Unit for Competitiveness based in Thailand. In his current role, he has developed an energy innovation strategy and focuses on developing partnerships with the Korean public and private stakeholders on high value bioenergy byproduct developments aligned with Thailand's circular economy aspirations. You know, he has been involved in many um, regional inter uh, governmental, international uh, organizations, committees, um, where he has really just shared and been involved in developing partnerships, developing strategies, 
for different governments. For example, you know, um, he was he, has, he was managing a Korea Thailand biopharmaceutical partnership. He had worked with the WHO aligned African network for drugs and diagnostics innovation um, to really look at partnerships innovation for neglected diseases, designing pharmaceutical strategies for Nigeria and Tanzania. And he has also been involved in um, the Korean government's research hospital, uh, serving selection, monitoring, evaluation, you know, of uh, really the, the trends and the things that were coming up. Working with the Korean Environment Institute, um, the Stockholm Environment Institute, and various, you know, public private stakeholders in ASEAN and, and really around the world, um, Jong Hyuk has really been critical in a lot of the planning, a lot of the uh, designing, and a lot of really the implementation. Yeah, so I am looking forward to hearing, you know, the things that he's doing right now. So thank you so much, Jong Hyuk, for joining us this afternoon as well. Thank you. Um, our third speaker is um, Ms. Ayako Mizuno. She is the program manager. Uh, for the Regional Knowledge Center for Marine Plastics Debris. In short, it is known as the RKC MPD uh, under EREA. Um, she has been in this role since November of last year. And you know, this center is a knowledge hub on marine plastic debris. It's a hot topic. You probably will read it in the news every now and then. And the center aims to support the ASEAN plus three countries to tackle this particular environmental issue. Um, the activities range from policy support to research, but one of its objectives is also to encourage and promote the business sector's contribution and involvement to um, really reducing marine plastic litter. And to achieve this goal, the RKC MPD has created an online platform this year named Private Sector Initiatives to reduce plastic waste and marine plastic debris. I hope that there is an acronym for that. Um, you know, especially in Singapore, we just love acronyms. So an acronym would be really good. Where these companies can showcase their products, technologies, and also the services contributing to keeping our oceans clean and to protect our ecosystem. Um, Ayako-san is seconded from the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies, where she's also the program manager at Sustainable Consumption and Production. Previously, she has held positions in the international development field as part of bilateral and multilateral cooperation for over 12 years. And in that capacity, she has worked pretty much across the continent, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Car Caribbean as part of um, Japanese diplomatic missions and the United Nations. So Ayako-san, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our final speaker is uh, Mr. Nicola Krosta, founder and CEO of Impact 46 based in Thailand. You can say that Nicola is one of the world's leading experts on impact investment, philanthropy, and nonprofit management. He has extensive experience among a wide range of impact-driven organizations. You know, um, he held senior management positions uh, within the UN and OECD for over a span of 18 years. At the United Nations in New York, Nicola played a key role in helping to define the global sustainable development goals. And as executive vice president and board member of the EPIC Foundation, he helped to build one of the most innovative philanthropic foundations from the ground up. He oversaw this large NGO, donor surveys you know, that were performed globally, and also the development of cutting edge nonprofit due diligence and social impact monitoring methodologies. And in Thailand, in the Bandik Foundation, you know, where he is the founder, it's a social enterprise, an award-winning one that provides access to services to thousands of migrant kids across Southeast Asia. And in recent years, Bandek has become a strategic implementing partner of UNICEF, 
winning the MIT Award for Social Innovation in 2017. He is also an author and lecturer. Um, he's a very hands-on person. You know, he directly oversees support to every client. And, you know, depending on the nature and scope of the task, I-46 will then pick and select, you know, the best team suited from around the world to ensure client satisfaction. So Nicola, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank so, you. you know, to our participants, um, we have these four, I would say experts, you know, seasoned um, people in a field joining us this afternoon. As the webinar goes on, you know, I want to encourage our participants, feel free and really, you know, any questions you have for our speakers, put it down in the chat box. Yeah, our speakers will try to answer them. Otherwise, my co-host Lena will then be moderating the Q&A where we will pick up your questions to ask our speakers. Okay, I want to jump straight now into our conversations this afternoon. And first off, I want to, um, you know, just ask Manwei, you know, as a sustainability consultant, Manwei, um, could you share with us your views of how this sustainability ecosystem has evolved over the years, in particularly looking at the rise of entrepreneurs in this space? Manwei, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thanks, TJ. Well, uh, thanks to Aria for inviting me. So really happy to come here and, and really share uh, with all of you what, what I know, right? But also at the same time, because uh, sustainability is a really fast evolving sector. So I'm, I'm also here to learn from the distinguished uh, panelists as well as from all of you out there, right? So maybe I'd like to start by uh, invoking the first line uh, from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, right? which is that it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, right? Um, so why that resonates with me uh, is because, I, I, I think we all know, right? So like, um, because uh, if you look at sustainability, if you look at some of the big rocks or the big issues within sustainability, so one would be climate change, and then one uh, maybe from a social sustainability point of view would be uh, global uh, inequality. Right. So th these are really uh, big rocks. These are very, very challenging uh, issues, right? And then, and, um, and as we look ahead, uh, in, in fact, come uh, in less than two weeks' time, so the, uh, the COP, uh, so that's the Conference of Parties, um, all the countries will be meeting, right, hopefully to, to make some headway on, on climate action, right? So, so we all know, we, um, at least those of us are in the sector, we... Uh, every time there's a, a big conference, right? So we look at it with a lot of uh, uh, anticipation, excitement, as well as some anxiety uh, as well. So these are challenging times, right? So certainly, right? So, but I, at the same time, um, I, I don't think it's all doom and gloom, right? So notwithstanding that the IPCC, uh, um, in fact, in uh, two months ago, they released a new report to say that uh, you know, we will definitely very, very likely hit our 1.5C uh, global warming within the next uh, one to two decades, right? So, and, uh, so to me, I, 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 I tend to be an optimist at heart. So, and then I would say that really in times of uh, difficulty and, and when there are risks, right, we can also find possibilities and opportunities, right? So, and, um, and I've, I've seen really that because I, I've been doing this, uh, I've been running my own business for three years. And prior to that, I was in Sentosa for, for almost 10 years. So I've really uh, been working on sustainability for more than a decade. And I, I'm, I'm actually very excited that I do see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, right? Some are seasoned entrepreneurs. Some are really very passionate uh, youth coming out of uh, school. And then they want to do something about uh, making a difference, right? Because if you think about it, so, what, what keeps all of us in sustainability going is that it's really one sector where you can really combine doing well and doing good, right? So, and, and, and I find that um, very uh, uh, satisfying and challenging and, and really, uh, and I always look forward to uh, working, right? Every, almost every day, yeah? Um, so maybe I'd like to frame this if we look at it as the opportunity, right? So I, I would really like to count 
look at it at two parts, right? So one is really what is the bigger market opportunity, right? Then I'll just mention briefly about what are some specific opportunities, right? So first, first and foremost is that there is actually a lot of uh, funding going into this sector, right? So for instance, there's this uh, Global Sustainable Investment Alliance. So they reported that this is quite a staggering figure, right? That sustainable investing assets uh, has reached US $35 billion in 2020. And there is a 15% increase over two years ago in 2018, right? So there's a lot of funding uh, going into this uh, sector, right? So, and, and, and we all know, right, at least for those of us who have tried our hand in, in getting something off the road, you need the funding to, to get things moving, right? Um, I think at the same time, uh, Kanta, for, for instance, so their market research firm, they found that they did a, a Asia foundational study in, which was published in July, 2021. And they found that 58% of uh, consumers will want to invest time and money to support responsible companies, right? So in other words, consumer sentiments are changing. People are not only want to buy more green products and services, but they're also willing to, you know, put money where their mouth is, right? So, so these are, I, 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 so in that sense, these are really a, a big kind of tectonic shift, right? In really how the market is uh, funded and, and really what are some of the consumer preferences. So equally, right, I think uh, businesses also want to go green. So, and, uh, and I do quite a bit of work for uh, corporates that supply to the MNCs, right? That, and then and increasingly they're telling me that they want to be sustainable. They want to do sustainable sustainability reporting because their big clients are asking for this, okay? So that's really the, the, the market movement, right? And then if we really zero in in terms of the opportunities, I, I think there are, there are a, a few kind of big buckets, right? So one, of course, uh, that's, uh, there is renewable energy because the cost of renewable energy has come down very dramatically. And really, if you are building and a new solar plant actually costs less to produce every kilowatt hour of uh, energy, compared to building a gas-fired or a coal power plant, okay? So renewable energy is one bucket. Um, two is that, and I, I'm sure all of you would have seen this in the supermarkets, we see the advent of uh, more plant-based um, food uh, materials, right? Say uh, ingredients, right? And of course, there is the Beyond Burgers, right? So because, um, and it's, it's actually quite a compelling case, right? Because first, uh, this shift towards a plant-based diet uh, it takes uh, more, uh, it takes less resources to produce, say, every pound of protein. And at the same time, um, it's, it's also better for the environment and it's also better for health, right? So this is really a big opportunity. And, um, and I've also seen um, new, startup with, uh, new startups with very exciting ideas, right? In fact, I just came across this uh, Singapore startup called handprint.tech. So later on, I'll post it. Um, in the chat, uh, um, in the chat function. So, and, and what they do is that they, they provide a plugin, right? So let's say, let's say if I'm an e-retailer, so they'll provide a plugin that I can uh, very easily incorporate into my storefront. And then I can allow my customers when they check out to, uh, you know, use some money to uh, invest some money in say buying an offset or to contribute towards planting a tree. Or even for me as the retailer, I can, actually use this plugin to, to give back to the community, right? Say out of, say every $100 of revenue, I can set aside, let's say two or $3, right? And then this is actually made known to my customers, yeah? So they're actually gaining uh, traction. So I just checked in with them uh, earlier this week. So, and then, and, um, and, and this is very exciting, right? Because there are all these, uh, because as the whole sustainability sector moves, right? So there are all these kind of uh, market connecting uh, opportunities that come about, right? So I have one more point, which is that um, I, I think in the realm of sustainability, we're fairly focused on environmental sustainability. But I, I hope that, you know, if let's say as an entrepreneur or, or as an entrepreneur wannabe, I think, or even as a funder, I think it's actually good to look at social sustainability as well. So, and there is this concept called the bottom of the pyramid, right? So, which is basically that there are a lot of uh, underserved uh, consumers out there, so particularly uh, in the uh, less developed countries. And um, again, I'd like to give an example of um, this uh, really interesting social enterprise coming out of the US. 
So and then and the, the problem they wanted to address was really that if you look at some of the uh, poorer communities, they have a hard time. Uh, the, the, the families, they cannot afford proper shoes uh, for their children. Not only that, e either that or, or uh, because kids grow very quickly, right? For those of us who are parents, we would know. And then they outgrow their shoes very quickly. So what the social enterprise did was that they, they designed and manufactured a shoe. It's called the shoe that grows, right? So in other words, it's a shoe that um, actually you can adjust, adjust the straps and so on and it expands uh, five uh, sizes, right? So it can last, or instead of lasting for six months to a year, it can last for two or three years or even more, right? So they have productized this and then their initial model was that they um, had uh, impact funding and then they actually uh, uh, then distributed it to a good number of countries. And, um, and it's such a popular idea that in fact, they are now commercializing it uh, in the US as well, right? So, so in other words, I, I thought it's a, it's a great example of a, bottom, a BOP concept that works. And also not only in terms of uh, catering to the underserved market, right? But it can, it's also commercializable. So that way, if you think about it, then eventually they can evolve a uh, um, financially sustainable model in that uh, they are, say, the four, uh, for profit operations could then subsequently fund right their uh, their humanitarian or non profit uh, um, efforts yeah so okay so I, I'll just uh, pause here and kind of hand it back to TJ yeah so uh, yeah again uh, excited to be here and looking forward to to interacting with all of you this afternoon thank you thank you very much Manwe you know um, you shared a lot of things I was really just you know scrambling to to take down some notes as well. Uh, but the shoe that grows, very interesting concept, you know. Yeah, maybe if you could also put it into the chat box for for the participants to take a look. Um, Ayoko san, I would like to move on to you next. Um, you know, in in your in your line of work, how how do you think the role of private sector? Um, what role do they play in terms of combating? You know, marine plastic debris, um, as well as really to support sustainability and inclusive business in general. Thank you for your question, TJ. As you just mentioned, you know, uh, earlier uh, when you presented me, um, since I work for the Regional Knowledge Center for Marine Plastic Debris, my answer will be skewed towards MPD, I mean, marine plastic debris issue a little bit. Um, as opposed to the whole uh, sustainability or environmental issue in general, which is an all-encompassing broad theme as it was just touched uh, upon by Moonway. But to answer your question, yes, the private sector is an important stakeholder to address marine plastic issue. Very often, private sector have been perceived and still are perceived to this day to be the uh, big plastic polluters, uh, frankly. But in reality, they can be part of the solution and they are part of the solution. And we are aware that many, many companies of all sizes have been part of the positive business paradigm shift. Um, the private sector can change uh, the linear way of uh, consumption and production to a more sustainable and circular one uh, with its economic power and you know, innovative technologies. But we are aware at the same time that private sector can only thrive when there's education and awareness of the public in, you know, uh, in general, as well as the government support uh, with you know, supportive policies and measures uh, such as you know, green public procurement and uh, source separation program for recycling. It's only when all those actors align uh, that the you know, true changes can be possible. Um, so we believe in the potential power of the private sector, but we also believe that good policies and heightened public awareness um, are also essential to facilitate such um, business to grow. To cite a concrete example, I think the private sector uh, uh, played a big role in the contribution to the harmonization of design for recycling uh, to improve PT bottle uh, recycling in Japan. Uh, the development of the guideline to standardize design for PT bottles 
was uh, led by the industry itself, uh, which is a very remarkable thing. But at the same time, I think it is important to take note that there was a government support behind. And with, you know, over time, people also got educated and, you know, took part actively in recycling activities as well. So um, this is where we see as regional knowledge center, our role, uh, we try to connect those actors and we try to draw um, lessons from good initiatives that already exist in ASEAN plus three region so that they can sort of serve as a good role models. Uh, my colleague is helping me to share our website. So please check out our activities via, via the link that will be shared uh, in the chat box. Uh, but yeah, coming back to your question, uh, the private sector do play an important role, but I think it's important to keep in mind that they are not the sole responsible party to address the marine plastic debris issue. Just as much as we cannot blame the private sector to be the only culprit, of plastic pollution, the solution cannot be also sought only uh, from the private sector. Um, so I'd like to talk more on what we can do as areas regional knowledge center to support those private sector initiative later on. But um, maybe my last word would be that with the COVID-19 pandemic and the amount of plastic waste used for the personal uh, protection equipment and also food delivery, that has been increasing. Uh, we hope that the pandemic reminds us that it is important to live sustainably in good harmony, not only with people from different corners of the world, but also with the environment. So thank you. Back to you, TJ. Thank you very much, Ayako-san. Live, sustainability, uh, live sustainably in good harmony. Um, I think that's important. And you know, I, I really echo what you shared earlier in terms of the need for that continued public and private partnership. Yeah, because it, it can never be just one side uh, and one side's issue and problem alone. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd like to move on to Nicola. Nicola, uh, you've been working you know, on the issue of um, sustainability and social impact for a very long time. You know? Uh, you were also part of the process contributing towards the whole establishment of the S SDGs. Um, how, from your perspective, how has the global picture via V sustainability SDG, do you see that it has changed um, since your time there? And, you know, I, we would love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you, TJ, for your question. Um, Look, I, I, yes, it has changed uh, in a very big way, um, as already, by the way, mentioned by, by previous uh, colleagues. Um, as you mentioned, I, I was incredibly lucky to be uh, working as head of policy at the, at the United Nations in New York uh, when we were drafting uh, or helping to member countries to draft the, the Sustainable Development Goals. So, it's been very interesting to see how things have, have evolved since then. Um, I have to say that when the SDGs uh, came together, I, I personally did not think that they would become so prominent, so well known around the world, that there would be so much discussion about the sustainable goals. Uh, I personally actually thought that the agenda that we had put together was perhaps too complex, too complicated. You know, when you compare it with the previous Millennium Development Goals, that they were much less, less complex. But the reality is that I was wrong. Uh, sustainability has become a big, big trend. Um, I think that we can see uh, the growth in importance of sustainability uh, in different ways. I would say certainly we see it very clearly in the corporate world as it has been mentioned already by the first speaker, we also see, we see corporates more and more uh, trying to define their sustainability strategy and trying to go beyond the classic CSR sort of tick the box approaches. We see a very clear trend in the world of finance and investing companies. When we look at the, you know, the rise of responsible investment, ESG investing and all that, it's absolutely huge. Uh, we see it, of course, with the now growth in terms of quantity and quality of social enterprises. So companies that 
plays at the very heart of their mission uh, the idea of sustainability and, and societal impact. Um, so this growth, I think, is, is clearly now accelerated, well, on the one end, by a long-term phenomenon, which basically it, it the, 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 uh, the arrival of a new generation of, of consumers, of investors, or employees, younger people that are much more aware of uh, societal issues. And also, I would say, this old trend definitely accelerated by the pandemic, uh, which I think brings about a, a sense of urgency around sustainability uh, from all of us. Uh, so big, a uh, big rise in sustainability. At the same time, what I would like to highlight is that, and perhaps this is the less rosy part of the picture, is that there is also with it a big rise in greenwashing, in calling sustainable what is not sustainable. Um, I use a lot now this term rainbow washing. So when you look at all the, the colors of the SDGs, and I have to say that I see some of the best companies putting those SDGs on their website and the strategies, but I also see some of the worst companies sticking SDGs logos everywhere. So the risk of rainbow washing or green washing is real. Um, and so what I perhaps what I would say here is that the rise is there, and, but I would dare to say that this is perhaps no longer the time to celebrate sustainability, but perhaps to protect the integrity of the concept. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, interesting, I have learned something new today, rainbow washing, you know, um, I was actually going to say we do see quite a lot of um, the pictograms and the tech lines being used by many companies these days. Yeah, so it's uh, something for us to think about, I think, especially for the business people. Uh, but yes, definitely it's time to protect the integrity of the SDGs. Um, I'd like to move on then to our fourth speaker, um, jong -Hyuk. You know, your work, currently involves um, a lot of collaboration between Korea and our region, uh, ranging from sustainable smart cities to bioenergy. Um, and perhaps, you know, I will ask you two questions at a go uh, so that you can share your thoughts all at one go as well. Um, what is your view of the region's development in the area of tech for good, sustainability, and also based on your experiences, what emerging trends, developments do you see in ASEAN, in this whole ecosystem? Over to you, jong -Yuk. Hey, uh, thank you very much, uh, TJ. Uh, I have a little bit different view uh, from the previous uh, three speakers. Uh, they uh, say some growing and also bright uh, uh, visions for the future. But uh, uh, I may say a little bit uh, uh, gloomy or dark uh, observation uh, I had. And also uh, considering the emergency or the necessity, uh, what uh, the global society uh, is doing is uh, quite uh, lacking behind uh, our goal. So uh, as uh, all of you acknowledge it, uh, technologies, especially in the C 4.0 related technologies, uh, the famous IoT, big data, AI, and others have great uh, potential to address various problems, including environmental sustain sustainability uh, in the region. Uh, new services, uh, cheaper and efficient services, and mesh of services can be provided uh, to solve uh, those problems. Uh, but uh, from my observation, uh, the region has at least uh, three problems to create a virtual circle to address uh, those problems. Uh, firstly, uh, market affordability is very low. So this is the problem to deploy new technologies and services. Uh, if the market affordability is low, then uh, it is very necessary to develop market affordable solutions, uh, but he, uh, this is hindered by the lack of uh, local capabilities. Uh, this is a second uh, problem. 
uh, lastly, uh, the region and uh, as a whole uh, depended, uh, depended on foreign technologies a lot uh, for a long time, uh, which hampered a coordination mechanism and hence relevant institutional arrangement among local public and uh, private uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, the plausible way to break uh, the vicious circle to create the virtual circle uh, may start from developing new business models, leveraging uh, emerging uh, regional market, uh, which was neglected by global platform companies because of uh, market uncertainty and also uh, natural entrance barriers of language and culture. Then uh, the local capabilities can be built up by leveraging uh, international uh, strategic uh, partnership for uh, architectural design and integration of globally available technologies. Uh, local coordination mechanism uh, can be nurtured uh, by triggering uh, collective association development with the support of uh, public authorities. Uh, TJ, as you mentioned, I'm engaged in uh, various Korean and Thailand, also ASEAN uh, partnership. Uh, the reason uh, is this, uh, Korea is a net uh, biodiversity uh, importing country, while ASEAN as a whole is net biodiversity uh, exporting region. Then uh, we can calculate the environmental uh, sustainability of ASEAN is a necessary condition uh, for Korean economic sustainability. So uh, Korean uh, public and private stakeholders uh, can be mobilized uh, to uh, work uh, with ASEAN stakeholders uh, to build uh, the innovative ecosystem creation uh, in the region. And this is uh, the uh, general response to your first question. And the second uh, question, uh, the emerging trends and developments uh, in the region uh, uh, for sustainability, uh, as sustainability ecosystem. Uh, uh, as uh, all of you uh, know better than me, uh, ASEAN countries are pursuing various national and ASEAN-wide initiatives for uh, sustainable development. Uh, among ASEAN uh, countries, uh, I want to focus on Thailand. Uh, Thailand has a, a BCG economy initiative, uh, which is bio, uh, circular, and uh, green e uh, economy. Uh, aforementioned uh, three bottlenecks of low market affordability, uh, low capability, and lack of local coordination mechanism uh, hinders uh, impactful ecosystem creation uh, in the country. Uh, Thai government, uh, as I mentioned, is promoting BCG economy and has granted universities and research institutes for a few demonstration projects. Uh, for which Thai private sectors companies, uh, mostly larger companies, have participated in, uh, in these projects, uh, which include also plastic uh, recycling. And the low market affordability hinders uh, market deployment of expensive, uh, relatively expensive uh, recycled products, uh, while Thai companies are reluctant to develop and uh, produce uh, innovative solutions. So the technology-based productivity enhancement and uh, product diversification uh, will increase uh, Thai companies' price and quality competitiveness, and then help local farmers to increase uh, their income, uh, by which uh, the biomass collection and recycling process uh, can be further facilitated. Uh, this entails uh, the three biocircular and uh, green economies uh, with uh, inclusiveness of local poor farmers. Uh, recently, uh, Thai government uh, is uh, now establishing uh, the BCG economy with widespread of biorefinery systems uh, as a strategy for future economic growth. Uh, there is also a political will and commitment, uh, as I understand, uh, farmers can bring their local biomass to uh, feasible small and decentralized uh, biorefineries as a feedstock. Then uh, they are processed into bio-based products. 
this is expected to help local uh, farmers uh, to solve their uh, poverty problems. And uh, for this purpose, uh, Thailand uh, definitely needs a few sets of technology to increase uh, bioenergy production efficiency and to develop new products uh, with bioenergy byproducts. Uh, I am now uh, uh, working with Thai company uh, to invite uh, a Korean company uh, which has invested and developed a relevant uh, platform and uh, solutions uh, to, to facilitate uh, this uh, new initiative of Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, jong -Hyuk. Hmm. Interesting points you brought up uh, from, a, from really this, this whole perspective of um, building the local capabilities without excessive um, reliance on foreign technology and capabilities. Um, I, I guess it's quite a fine balance that we have to make, you know, uh, because when a country does not have that local capabilities, probably the fastest and easiest way is usually to, you know, adopt foreign technologies first, do a bit of reverse engineering. Yeah. So I think um, interesting, interesting sharing. Thank you so much for sharing your insights in terms of what has been happening, especially in Thailand. Um, I'd like to go back to Nicola, you know, um, we were talking a little bit earlier about, I guess, you know, um, with Ayako-san private-public partnerships. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, you know, how, how can policymakers um, support the development of sustainable and inclusive businesses? And also, you know, uh, we would want to hear from you, what trends, developments have you been observing across this region? Nicola? Yes, thank you. Uh, complex question, but uh, let me let me try. <laughs> um, there is indeed uh, obviously a role for policymakers, for governments to uh, support and to accelerate uh, a transition towards sustainability, and in particular to encourage sustainable businesses, social enterprises. Um, I think that they there are at least four things that that uh, policymakers, governments could do. The, the first has to do, and I would like to refer in particular to social enterprises, which are a very important and, in my view, still relatively neglected um, part of this landscape and neglected by governments and, and policymakers. First, defining, helping to define legally even what social enterprises are helping to define as precisely as possible what do we mean by sustainability? What do we mean by sustainable? So there is an effort, obviously, that is going on in some countries, but that needs to accelerate in terms of clarity as to what are we talking about? Well, what can be defined as social enterprise? What can be defined as sustainable business? So this has to do with legislation. It has to do also with, in my view, with a certain control over certifications, because we see now abundance and emergence of all sorts of certifications around sustainability. Um, the second one, in my view, has to do with taxation. Uh, governments, and, and I am aware this is a very complex area, but governments need to go further in fundamentally giving an advantage to sustainable businesses, to social enterprises. Uh, what I find incredible uh, still is that in most countries, certainly in Asia, but this applies for instance to Europe as well. In most countries, if you are a young person and you start a social enterprise, so you are really contributing to, you know, to, to, to progress, to, to uh, tackle a development challenge, you are treated pretty much in the same way than a normal or even a bad business. You don't really have much advantage. So we need to find a way, and I guess taxation should be one, to give a clear advantage to uh, social enterprises. I make one example that I, I discussed just uh, this morning. I was in Bangkok. In the same street, I had a very big, very uh, famous uh, co uh, you know, coffee shop chain that starts with S and ends with bucks. And, uh, and then 
there was uh, very close to it, there is a fantastic affair that provides training opportunity with, uh, to youth with autism. I think that if I enter in the second one, I should perhaps not pay the TVA on my coffee. And perhaps I should pay it in the first one. Just making an example. Uh, the third point has, has to do with infrastructure. Uh, I think that especially the smallest uh, sustainable businesses, social enterprises sometimes struggle with that. I think that very concretely, not only national governments, but perhaps municipal governments could offer co-working spaces, incubators, and things like that to these kind of businesses. Uh, last but not least, fourth point uh, has to do with investment. Um, in my view, policymakers have the means today to put together investment vehicles or grant facilities that basically can support financially uh, businesses that, uh, that deserve uh, that support. Um, I, I, I have to say that these are still very early days, both across the ASEAN region and across other geographies on all of these issues. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, the UK and the US are examples of countries that are still leading in these areas across in particular the, the four areas that I mentioned, but there is innovation popping up, popping up pretty much everywhere, including in the ASEAN region, for instance, in, in Singapore. I think that there are many very interesting examples. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I do agree. I guess, you know, un, until such time where um, the legal definition can be more robust, the probably the probable challenge is really then how do you how do you tackle taxation? How do you tackle all the grants and the funding? Yeah, because then you have many people that will start to put themselves into that definition if it's too loosely bound. You know, but um, very important thoughts though. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, before I, I move on to our next speaker, you know, I just want to encourage our participants. If you have any questions for our speakers, please do drop them in um, the chat box, you know, so that we can put them together. And during the Q&A, Lena can then you know, address uh, with the speakers the questions that you have. So please feel free to put it into the chat box. Um, Ayako-san, you... I think you mentioned briefly about the initiative that the center had um, promoting private sector's effort. Um, could you perhaps share a little bit more about the initiative, you know, for the benefit of our uh, uh, participants and for myself as well? Yeah. So please, please do share with us. Sure. Uh, maybe first allow me to reintroduce a little bit, um, like briefly, what is the Regional Knowledge Center for Marine Plastic Debris and what we do. Um, so the Regional Knowledge Center for Marine Plastic Debris, or RKCMPD, as it was, you know, pronounced by you, you know, uh, um, we are established within the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, or AREA, um, in October 2019. So it's been like two years that we have been operating. And our goal is to support the ASEAN Plus three member states to tackle marine plastic debris issue. And by ASEAN uh, plus three member state, it means the ASEAN 10 countries plus China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. Uh, we work not only with the government, uh, but also with the research institute, academia, private sector, of course, international organizations and NGOs. And our goal is to really uh, create a regional network and raise awareness uh, regarding marine plastic debris issues uh, promote uh, innovative actions within the country, and also to facilitate national and regional cooperation. Again, uh, since we believe uh, in the private sector to play an important role uh, in marine plastic debris issue, uh, the RKCMPD, the Regional Knowledge Center, has decided to create an online platform to highlight and promote private sector's uh, positive business uh, initiatives to reduce plastic waste in, in the ASEAN Plus 3 region. Although the official name is Private Sector Initiatives to Reduce Plastic Waste and Marine Plastic Debris, as it was introduced earlier by you, TJ, but do not fret, we do have a shorter name. We call it a Private Sector Platform to make it easier, um, although it's not exactly an acronym. But yes, we do have this uh, Private Sector Platform. Uh, uh, it's a regional platform that we gather private companies 
operating in ASEAN plus three region, so these th 13 countries, to present their business activities that are conducive to society with less plastic waste and, of course, less plastic leakages to the environment. Um, some of the business activities examples that you can already find on our platforms are efforts to reduce uh, uh, the improved uh, resource efficiency of plastic, um, alternative to uh, plastic, um, alternative material to plastic, uh, plastic recycling, uh, improved uh, plastic uh, waste management, um, and other innovative technologies and tools to sort of better track and manage uh, plastic waste in the environment. So our objective here is uh, threefold. Uh, first is to collect those information in, into one cohesive uh, platform uh, so that we can sort of highlight positive business initiatives. Secondly, to acknowledge the private sector as an important stakeholder and sort of yeah put them in, in the forefront. And to finally um, facilitate you know private sector to gain more momentum and and um, expand their business opportunities within the SM plus three region and of course beyond. Uh, so the questions we get asked quite often is um, what are the conditions uh, for the private sector to sort of take part in this um, uh, platform? And there are two, so it's pretty simple. Uh, first of all, you have to be a private company, of course, um, whose business activities take place in the ASEAN plus three region. So if your company operates in one of the 13 countries, you clear the first condition. And secondly, your business activity have to contribute to plastic waste reduction or more specifically to marine plastic debris uh, prevention. So as long as you operate in those, in those 13 countries and you contribute to uh, plastic reduction, uh, plastic waste reduction, you are eligible to uh, register on our platform. We try to make it uh, as welcoming and uh, all encompassing as possible. And um, by being featured on our platform, company can gain better um, exposure and be known to potential customers within ASEAN plus three. Uh, maybe they can expand business to business or business to consumer opportunities. Um, and this can also be an opportunity for companies to sort of talk about their sustainability efforts to a wider public. And finally, it can appeal to a possible uh, investors to sort of uh, expand their businesses. And all this, of course, is free of charge. As an international organization, we do not charge our private sector partner. So we try to use this platform to sort of support them and promote their efforts. Uh, so yes, again, my colleague is going to share the info in the chat box. So please check out uh, our platform and uh, share, share it with anyone who might be interested. Uh, we also have uh, our social media, Facebook, Instagram, where we try to disseminate marine plastic debris related information uh, quite often. So if you're interested in, in this uh, thematic, please uh, follow us on, on our social media as well. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer later on. Thank you very much. If no one else has a question for you later, I do have one for you. Uh, because I am personally quite interested in this whole marine plastic debris issue. Uh, having spent a good part of um, the last 20 years actually working in the chemical industry, you know, so um, yeah, I have some interesting uh, things, but I will follow the center. So I also want to encourage um, our participants, you know, really for all the speakers that are here this afternoon, you know, please, please do look them up, their website, find them on LinkedIn, connect with them, because I think they would really love to do that um, so that you can find out more about the things that they're doing um, and engage with them. You know, this, this, is a, this is the economy we are today where that building of networks is important, that building of relationships is important, whatever sectors you may be in. So for the participants, you know, don't hesitate. I, I, would, I would probably just uh, put our speakers on the spot to say they will be happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Yeah. So they are all on LinkedIn. So they would be happy to connect with you. Please go check them out. 
Now, let's move back to our entrepreneur, Manwei. Yeah, um, we, we've, heard, we've heard quite quite a bit in terms of, um, I think, what, what can and should happen on perhaps at a higher level, at a policy level, at a governmental level, you know. Um, but from your perspective as an entrepreneur, uh, for, for this whole ecosystem and and I guess the, the, the entrepreneurs that have begun to spring up within this ecosystem, for, for them to continue thriving, um, what do you think are important factors to consider? You know, mm. we'll, we'll be happy to hear from you. Yeah, uh, thanks, TJ. I, I think first and foremost, um, I don't think there'll be a post-pandemic well, right? So it'll be, because I mean, if you look at it, we just have to coexist, right? So I, I, I think we're really looking at a cold pandemic recovery, right? So, and, um, and to me, the silver lining from this whole uh, COVID-19 uh, global crisis uh, is that uh, it shows that the world um, can come together, right? I mean, we can mobilize, right? I mean, we've seen that in terms of the corporate sector, we've seen that in terms of, um, of um, partnerships, right, across tri-sectors, we've seen that, we've seen that in terms of uh, countries, right, and um, of course, if you look at, say, support for the COVAX program, uh, it can be better, but I think if you, but I mean, um, again, uh, um, at least the, the, a, a good number of the developed countries have stepped forward. Okay, so maybe to answer your question, I, I, I think what we need to do is really to build a sustainable ecosystem. Right, so for for um, green or sustainable entrepreneurship to flourish, so then I, I would look at it maybe from the perspectives of the um, I I think there are three key parties involved. So one will be the entrepreneurs themselves, um, and you know when when Nicola mentioned about greenwashing and rainbow washing, it, it really resonated with me because uh, I because these days I, I do get approached by a good number of startups. Right, and then they are all, um, you know, they, they have a, they have a, uh, an idea, right? And then they are like, oh, uh, Manwe, can I? Can we talk to you? Can we touch base with you? And uh, and can you be our sustainability advisor, right? So so usually, uh, when then I always ask them, can you send me your deck, right? So uh, because and why I do that is because uh, I, I I think it's always good to uh, really be clear about what is the sustainability angle, right? Say as an entrepreneur, right? So because um, um, I, I, I think out there, there's the risk of greenwashing and there's also the risk of uh, misinformation or lack of uh, information uh, as well, right? So that's why um, I always encourage entrepreneurs to do their research and then be clear about what is what makes their product or service sustainable, right? So I, I, think, I think that's one. So, so in other words, the entrepreneurs themselves uh, must level up. And uh, equally, I, I think the entrepreneurs must also be clear about uh, what they want to achieve and what is their business model, right? So because in the realm of uh, sustainability, again, right, so there's environmental sustainability, uh, there's social sustainability, certain things are bankable. That means in the sense that you can sell it, like I think the shoe that grows, right? So there is uh, a commercial angle to it. But let's say, because I also do a, um, some work uh, in the um, disability sector. And I, I can see that a lot of the social enterprises there, uh, the charities there, uh, if you look at the services that they are rendering and the, the things that they want to do, um, they, are, they are not really commercial, right? So that means you, you can't sell those uh, products and services directly to the market, or, or at least you will not be able to generate a sufficient revenue stream to support all the things that you want to do. Right, so in which case, uh, then for if you have an idea like that, then chances are you might need to look for either impact uh, funding and or donations. Yeah. So so okay. So in other words, from an entrepreneur's point of view, they need to be clear about what is a sustainability angle, and two is that how would they finance what they want to do. Okay. So that's on the entrepreneur's uh, perspective. Then the second group would really be the funders, right? So and um, I did mention that very big number about 30 over billion dollars, right? So, um, but I, I, I think at the same time, my sense is that um, I think there's still a lot more uh, funders out there uh, um, who want to support things which are 
uh, commercializable and sustainable at the same time, right? So, and there are a few, but I would say that, uh, I mean, more often than not, sometimes there's a bit of a trade-off. So what I hope to see is really, um, really more uh, impact investors, right? Uh, coming uh, to the fore, right? And then uh, in that they would value the social impact, the environmental and social impact as much as the commercial returns, right? So because we need that, right? So because it's only if the, uh, these investors, they can have a bit of a, a mindset shift, uh, then I think the, the whole sector would flourish. Okay, th then the third player would be the government. I, I think I, uh, Nicola had made some fantastic points about what uh, role the government uh, can play. So maybe I would just like to uh, add a couple more points. So one is that um, I, I think the government plays a very big role in signaling, right? So in terms of that, you know, they want uh, this sector to grow, like, like in Singapore, for instance, a couple of months back, the, the Singapore government launched the, uh, the Singapore Green Plan, right? So, and I, I thought that's, that's a really well thought out plan in that it had a few kind of uh, critical pillars and with specific uh, initiatives, right? And, and, and the government didn't stop there, right? And then in fact, they've followed through. So, and then they have actually created platforms for say members of the public to give their views as well as uh, even in terms of test bidding platforms. So whereby they, uh, they would say, put out a grant call, right? To say that, let's, uh, and there, there was a, a specific example, right? Because in Singapore with this, uh, well, TJ will be familiar with this, with this uh, offshore man-made island called Jurong Island. So where uh, you have many chemicals companies that are anchored there, right? So, and then, and then the government recently launched a grant call to look at, to invite proposals to implement uh, green ideas on the island in partnership with the companies there. And the government would fund uh, these initiatives. So, I, and I, I think, I think that's, that's a fantastic thing to do, right? Because uh, in that sense, you create that uh, partnership model and then, and by providing funding, you help to de-risk, uh, you know, what the entrepreneurs have to go through, right? Okay, then just one, one, one more final point about what the government can do is, I, I feel it's really to uh, create a level playing field. Right, so um, maybe I give a, uh, an example, and this is also related to plastic waste, right? So because for a long time, uh, well, well, at least finally in, in Singapore, um, after many, many months and years of deliberation, the, the Singapore government has finally announced that they are looking into a charge uh, for use of consumption of plastic bags in Singapore, right? So, and, uh, and that's because hitherto, how the model works in Singapore is that it was pretty much left to the different establishments, right? The supermarkets, the F&B restaurants, and so on. It's up to them to decide whether or not they want to charge for plastic bags. So, and, um, and it's quite interesting because I used to have some interactions with the supermarkets. And then what they were telling me is that they felt that that wasn't fair to those of them who wanted to be green because they say that very often they might, uh, sometimes they'll face a backlash from the, their customers saying that, oh, why are you charging me for a plastic bag, right? So are you, are you trying to profiteer from this and so on, right? And then, and uh, so there was really disparate practices, right? So some of them charge, some of them incentivize if you bring your bag and so on. And then there was actually quite a bit of confusion on the part of the consumers, right? So that's an example, right? So, and I think uh, a plastic charge is, is great, right? Because it levels the playing field uh, across uh, all the different establishments. Uh, for the uh, men in the street, it's easier for them to connect, right? To kind of join the dots to understand uh, what's going on, right? So of course, there will be a, a small number of people who will not be, who will not take to this policy change well, but eventually they will have to get around uh, to it, right? So, 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 okay. So just to summarize very quickly, I think, I think we really need to look at the three key sets of players, right? The, um, the entrepreneurs, the, um, the funders and the government, and they all need to come together, right? And then to kind of create that 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 um, kind of living ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you very much, Manwei. Yes, the ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurs, investors, and the government, uh, each one having a part to play. Yeah. Uh, thank you, all our speakers. I know there have been a few questions that have come up in the chat box, so I will now hand the time over to Lena, who will just um, bring us through the questions. Lena, over to you.
Yes, thank you, TJ, and thank you to all of the speakers for a very insightful discussions. Uh, now we have uh, two particular questions on the chat box. The first question is that I would like to address is entitled for all of the speakers. Uh, so um, the first question is about uh, when developing an entrepreneurship or in particular social entrepreneurship at the early stage, it's always questions on its business model and how could they make a revenue. And this platform, uh, this webinar series uh, objective, one of it is to support our audiences uh, to trying to embrace them a journey of or as an entrepreneurship and obviously to get the investment. So um, the question is, so what are the key tips to uh, answer these questions? And do you have an example? I heard that uh, some of the speaker has implicitly given some advice, but maybe Nicola, uh, you would like to start first as we are just currently developing the uh, collaborations on social entrepreneurship research project as well. So Nicola, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, um, yeah, actually, I, as I wrote in the chat, um, it, it is true, those challenges exist, especially for social startups. Uh, but I think that uh, well, the good news is that there are more and more examples of successful enterprises. So these are enterprises that can uh, both deliver significant social impact and uh, sometimes actually quite spectacular financial return. So these examples exist. Um, I was mentioning uh, a couple in the chat. Um, think about uh, Simplon.org, for instance, is a social enterprise in France. I just met them a couple of weeks ago, uh, valuated them more than, I think, $15 million uh, today, social enterprise. Um, the one I mentioned earlier in Tannen, Steps with Terra, uh, it's a chain of restaurants and cafes that provide uh, training opportunities to uh, youth with autism. So these examples exist, there are many more. And so I, I think that the good news is that beyond the theory, there are concrete examples that we can look at and that young uh, social entrepreneurs can refer to. Yes, uh, thank you Nicola for your answers. And moving forward, uh, maybe John Hill, you want to share something on this? Over to you. Please. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, uh, respond. Uh, for this kind of a environmental uh, entrepreneurship, I believe uh, the uh, market uh, regulation uh, is important. Uh, without uh, government intervention to create a certain uh, market, the social entrepreneurs uh, uh, cannot uh, sustainably uh, manage it. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, we enforce a uh, strong regulation to create uh, certain recycled products. Uh, then uh, the people uh, will not uh, like government very much. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of a trap. Uh, because of that, uh, I have emphasized that the uh, social even social entrepreneurs, they may start with, with uh, specific solutions. When uh, the market is small and, and uh, uh, not affordable, then uh, how to uh, engage uh, those uh, not willing to pay uh, customers uh, to engage uh, in, in the whole business uh, chain? And then uh, we can uh, create a, cer a certain sustainable mechanism so uh, when uh, you consider uh, the uh, business model uh, in uh, your areas, uh, you may see uh, uh, those things uh, in, in comprehensive way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the questions. Um, moving forward to Moonway, you want to add more on this? Over to you, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe let me just, <clears throat> Uh, kind of uh, reiterate what I mentioned earlier about <clears throat> uh, social enterprises in general. Okay, sorry, as in, um, I, I, I think, again, right, I think kind of building on the funding bit, I think it's good for the entrepreneurs to be clear um, where is the money coming from, right? So at least to identify the uh, potential funding sources, right? So I, ideally, 
um, if you want to adopt a more commercial uh, perspective, then, then the money uh, needs to come from the market. That means people must be willing to buy your uh, products and services, right? So um, uh, again, maybe I give an example because uh, there was once, uh, this was uh, about a year or two ago, I advised this uh, social enterprise and then what, what it was uh, basically a bakery, right? And then and um, they, 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 were employing, they were employing youths with uh, special needs, yeah? And then, and, uh, and then and how their business model uh, was structured was that they would, uh, first they were set up legally as a nonprofit. And then, and, uh, then, of course, they will sell the things that were made, right? And then, and then the, the money gets um, uh, used to pay the overheads, the salaries, and, uh, and even the youth that came onto the program, they were paid uh, uh, either a training allowance or a salary uh, as well, right? So, but, um, but unfortunately, they were losing money, right? So then, then in fact, I advised the, um, um, the founder that she needed to, uh, because since she was legally a nonprofit, then she could actually source for donations and sponsorships, which she, which she did, right? So, and I, I think that's just an example, right? Because I, the, I guess as an entrepreneur, a very important thing is that I, we, you know, we need to be uh, creative and resourceful, right? And then, and in fact, I, I would say that the ideal case is really to diversify your uh, sources of funding, right? And, and which was what happened in this case. I mean, uh, the, the, at least the, the model was uh, fairly robust in that uh, there was revenue in terms of the things, uh, you know, their cookies and, and, yeah. and their breads and so, and their quiche, which they sold, right? And then they were also sourcing for donations and uh, corporate uh, sponsorships uh, as well. Yeah, so, so that's, that's something to bear in mind. I mean, good to, I mean, so in other words, the devil's in the details, right? So it's good to scrutinize, you know, how would you make your P&L balance, right? And, and that, that, that uh, financial discipline applies so long as you run any type of organization, right? Whether you are in the uh, for-profit or in the non-profit uh, sectors. Yeah. Thank you. So the key is like, do we do the diversifications on your business models? Yeah. yeah. So um, Ayako, Sang, do you want to uh, share a bit of your perspective of this? Over to you. Please. Thank you, Lina. Um, yes, I, I think so far the question asked in the chat box uh, is more about the business model and, and you know, the concrete advice to the uh, entrepreneurs. So I would like to leave that to our experts and maybe to TJ as well to, uh, for concrete advice. Uh, it's, it's a little bit outside my expertise. So thank you. Back to you. Yes, okay. Sure, it's fine. So yeah, um, uh, the second question, moving forward to the second question is uh, about the changing landscape startup in ASEAN. I can't deny these questions because it has been typed twice in the chat box. So um, Moonway, maybe you would like to answer this question first. So over yeah. to you, okay, uh, sure, sure. Uh, I, I would say that um, while I advise uh, entrepreneurs, right, I, I'm, I'm not really a, a kind of a venture capital specialist. So what, what I did was I, I quickly uh, did a quick search. And, um, and in fact, the amount of, and, and I hear this anecdotally as well, right? So because I hear of uh, very well-funded startups that become uh, unicorns, that means they are valued at more than a billion dollars in the Southeast Asia region, right? And, and then I, I have a chart here, which uh, later I'll, I'll post a link. So whereby the amount of uh, VC funds uh, in, in Southeast Asia has really rocketed, right? So in fact, uh, it started uh, in the region of maybe uh, more than a little bit over 100 million US dollars in 2010. And then in uh, 2019, it has actually grown to $8.6 billion, yeah? So, um, so the money is there, right? So the money is there looking at, uh, at startups uh, to invest in. So, but then again, because this is really more VC money. So, th so th this, this is the money for which, yes, you can do good, but you must show them that you can do well, you can scale, right? And, and, and build uh, a viable uh, um, commercial business model uh, that could go global, right? So I, I would say that... Um, Okay, so that's really from the numbers perspective, but I would say that anecdotally, I think the, um, the startup sector is quite vibrant. And if at all, I think then um, also because of uh, COVID, 
uh, in, in a way, uh, as always, right? I mean, whenever there's a, a, um, a global health crisis, then there are winners and then there are losers in terms of from a sectoral point of view. And uh, what I know is that, uh, say, if you are doing uh, education, right, and ed tech, I think that's a very hot right now. And then and uh, even sectors like healthcare and so on. So uh, because I come from a tourism background, so that's one area where um, that isn't doing so well currently. But, but it's quite interesting in that sometimes you get uh, hybrids, right? So like, for instance, uh, while, while physical tourism is not doing well, but uh, I see a, a, quite a growing interest in virtual tourism, right? And in fact, uh, Amazon, they have also started a service called Amazon Explore. So whereby you can actually, uh, uh, you can check it out uh, again, uh, later I'll post a link. So whereby uh, you can participate in these uh, virtual tours, which are guided by someone say in Japan or in Barcelona. And then, and why Amazon is interested in this is that the, the tour guys who participate, they also sell things, right? They might say, oh, you know, here, yeah, you can buy this very nice, uh, uh, you know, lacquered bento box, right? And then, and who does the fulfillment is Amazon. Right. So everybody wins, right? Because, uh, of course, now that there's no physical tourism, I mean, uh, the tour guides, uh, um, tour travel operators, attraction operators, and so on, they're all struggling, right? So, so in that sense, this, this virtual, this pivoting towards offering virtual experiences is a, is a boon to them. Yeah. So in other words, okay, maybe I, I think it's, it's good, right? So I think uh, I see a lot of uh, new ideas, right? And uh, again, right, maybe just to end by repeating what I said earlier, I think really in times of transition, in times of uh, challenge, and then you then in a way, all of us are forced to be more creative, right? So we are, we can't do things the way they've always been done. And so therein lies the, the opportunity for entrepreneurship to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Moonway. So uh, yeah, indeed the COVID-19 has accelerating the startup landscape. So Nicola, uh, do you want to share something on this, on the landscape of startup in ASEAN region? So over to you, please. Oh, thank you. I think that the most important things have been said. Thanks. Okay. So uh, John hope you have anything to say? Because I noticed that there is a, very uh, famous Netflix drama on Korea, from Korea about <laughs> up on this. So if you want to share any perspective on this, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, but uh, I'm not good at uh, KX or K-drama or K-pop. Uh, uh, I do agree with you. There is a strong uh, potential for uh, startups in the region. And even before the COVID-19, uh, a few uh, startups uh, became very successful uh, giants like uh, Grab, uh, Bojek. And I believe uh, uh, during uh, the COVID-19, uh, their powers uh, in the market uh, has grown sharply. And uh, as we noticed, uh, there is uh, the investment uh, fund uh, increased but uh, I'm uh, uh, skeptical that uh, this increased fund funding uh, may facilitate uh, new startups, but uh, they may reinforce the existing uh, the big uh, startups. So uh, I believe uh, there is a certain uh, way uh, to uh, create uh, new, new entrepreneurship, but uh, that the, the issue is that uh, the previous COVID-19 uh, uh, startups before COVID-19, and uh, they are ASEAN uh, startups, but uh, they funding from outside and managed by outside. So we cannot say they are real uh, the ASEAN startups. So how to uh, incubate the real ASEAN startups uh, are also important. And uh, those people who uh, understand uh, the, uh, the market and also the problems uh, uh, of their society, and then uh, how can address uh, the problems uh, in the context of uh, their problems, uh, those uh, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs uh, should be increased. Then uh, uh, ASEAN region as a whole uh, can have the real, uh, the, innovative uh, ecosystem. Yeah, thank you for the answers. And 
I think uh, we're running out of time now. And maybe if I may add actually in ASEAN itself, Indonesia is currently having the largest uh, unicorn existed. Uh, we have like Jong Hyuk stated, we have like Gojek as well is one of them. So um, maybe because we are running out of time now, I'm afraid we have to close. So thank you very much again to Moonway, to Nicola, to Jong Hyuk and to Aya Kosang. So uh, we are very pleased to have you today, and um, I'm over. I'm changing. I'm over. Sorry, I'm moving forward to TJ again. And thank you very much for the very insightful discussions. So thank you all for participating. Thank you for the questions. You know, in the interest of time, I will also keep my farewells short. Um, definitely look forward to connecting with all of you. You know, I'm also on LinkedIn, so please feel free to connect. Uh, Julia, closing remarks. We will also be very, very short because we are indeed running out of time. But thank you so much for staying with us until the very end. Many thanks to our excellent speakers. I learned a lot from all of you, Monway, Jiang Yop, Nicola, and Ayako. And be prepared you know, to uh, come back with us for our grand finale of the 2022 ESI season. Uh, on the 25th of November. So see you soon, stay tuned. We will share more information very soon. Have a good uh, afternoon and rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.